the first visitors called them the Encantadas, the Enchanted Isles. At times, they seemed to disappear, if they were ever there at all. The creatures who inhabited them were just as strange and curious, like no other animals on Earth. Familiar, yet different. Isolated from the rest of the world, in this exotic archipelago, they were slowly and surely evolving. Different bodies, different heads, different beaks. Into this world, the adventurers came. Robinson Crusoe among them, and the naturalist, Charles Darwin, whose name would be forever linked here. Soon, the secrets of these enchanted Galapagos Islands were uncovered. By 1977, hundreds of scientists had probed and poked them. Tourists had claimed them a vacation spot. Like a fossil, the Galapagos Islands became a curious imprint of the magic that happened here. No one expected more, but the Enchanted Islands had a surprise for them. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis in the Galapagos Islands. 160 years ago, Charles Darwin walked here on James Island for one week. He thought the marine iguanas were hideous and stupid looking. Of the finches, he wrote in his diary, the most curious fact is the perfect gradation in the size of the beaks. There are no less than six species with graduated beaks. It didn't make that much of an impression on him here, but when he got back to England and began writing up his notes, he realized the finches held the secret to the origin of life. It was one of the most important discoveries in the age of science. But it was only a theory. Today, two scientists, Peter and Rosemary Grant, have picked up where Darwin left off. They've come back to the Galapagos to study Darwin's finches. They have observed over 20 years and measured to confirm Darwin's theory. In the process, they have seen things Darwin never dreamt of seeing. The Galapagos Islands sit uncomfortably on the equator, 621 miles west of Ecuador in the Pacific. There are 18 islands, only five are inhabited. It's a strange and uneasy place. There's little beauty, even less calm. The world for the few of God's creatures who live here is raw and frantic. Life and death coexist easily. But through scientists' eyes, especially evolutionary biologists, this is the most wonderful place on Earth. Well, it's not too bad. I wish it was a little bit lower. Yep. There's a pit come to greet us. Peter and Rosemary Grant made their first trip here 22 years ago to this island called Daphne Major to begin a field study on a group of birds called Darwin's finches. There's a finch? Yep. To land on Daphne, you truly have to want to get on this island. There's one rock to jump onto, surrounded by 300 feet of shark-infested water. Yes. 
Before they climb up, straight up, they'll rinse everything, tents, nets, food, in the ocean. Okay, I will wash. Do you want to give me some in a bucket? I'll do it here. Bringing in any new plants or predators could be disastrous to the finches. <laughs> Bringing in anything that might alter the environment, parasites, insects, could be disastrous to their study. Is that, are those washed? Yep, they're washed. <laughs> Well, I'm washed to you. <laughs> the finches on Daphne, like the rest of the animals in the Galapagos, have no fear of humans. They simply don't know they should. They have few enemies, except for an occasional owl, and even fewer competitors for food. Their main enemy is the weather and whatever toll it takes on the vegetation they eat. These humans are simply curious. Okay, I'll take these over to camp now. Before they get to work, the Grants will spend the better part of the day setting up their camp under the watchful eyes of some old friends. There are 13 species of Darwin's finches in the Galapagos. Named for Charles Darwin, the first person to collect them, they vary in size from three to six inches, in color by a matter of shades. Their average lifespan is about five years, though the Grants know one 16-year-old who lives above the crater. They separate during the dry season, between June and December when food is scarce and come back together at the first sign of rain in January, when the males begin to sing. They sing to attract mates. Some mate for life, others will have as many as 11 mates in their lifetimes. And when their young are born, the father will take his turn feeding and imprint his young with his song. The islands here are rich in food for finches. But because they are enchanted islands, no two have the same vegetation. The finches have adapted. From island to island, species to species, none have the same beak. On Daphne, where cactus is plentiful, the cactus finch has a long beak to reach into the flower for its nectar. On Espanola, the ground finch with its short, deep beak concentrates on seeds under the soil. On Santa Cruz, the tree finch with its parrot-shaped beak strips the tree bark looking for insects. And so it goes, through 13 distinctive species with 13 distinctive beaks. Their food choices sometimes overlap, but for the most part, they only compete for food during extreme weather conditions. The variation in their beaks is often so slight, only careful measurements can show the difference. But they are different. Darwin's finches have evolved. Shall we put out the, the nets first? Yes, and they're up there. Okay. Darwin theorized it. Other evolutionary biologists explained it, and finally, these two people have seen it happen, twice in the last 20 years. Camasaisi, just about 15 meters below you and slightly to the right. 
Once camp is set up, the Grants begin their inventory of the island to see who made it through the summer. What is the cordia here? A mixture, or is it? It's um, half. It's a half. mixture. It's exactly half. Uh, there we are. Oh, it's three oh seven, I believe. Three oh seven was one of the ones born in nineteen ninety one. Yep, three oh seven. Uh, it may be nesting there. So let's see if there's a Magnorostrus down here. Yep, there may be. One of the Grant's researchers was once asked to describe Daphne Major. It's not nice, it's simple, he said. That's why they go there. A tour guide had an easier description. It's a hellhole. It's 100 acres of volcanic rock with some plants thrown in for humor. There's no shade, except for the lean-tos the Grant's put up. No water or food, except what they bring. That courtship feeding involved an unbanded female. Yes, I got that, yes. The closest island is a two-hour boat ride away. There's a shortwave radio in case of an emergency. But they've learned to be self-sufficient. You want to go down first? The strange white birds with yellow-brown feet, they're Daphne's version of a roadblock. Masked boobies. They seem to choose their territories by carefully calculating where a human will walk. And then pecking or flapping to try and make the person fall into the ocean. Or it just seems that way. The Grants know their tricks, and frankly, there are other birds taking their full attention right now. One one. Is that one one or one? One one. I think it's one one. Oh, there's a bird. I'll leave that one to you. Is that three okay, or six? Okay, that's three, three or six. metal six. Yes, there's a brown bird down here. I'll try and find it. They first came to Daphne Major in 1973 with three questions they wanted to answer. The question of whether species compete. The reason why populations are so variable, at least some are, and then the third one, the question of how species are formed. All of those questions could be addressed with a study, a field study, of Darwin's finches in the Galapagos. They chose Daphne because it was small and simple. And we realized that in studying a very small population, we could get a handle on most of the birds on this island. So it was like working in a little laboratory in a sense. There were only two main inhabitants on the island, Scandon, the cactus finch, and Fortis, the medium ground finch. The cactus finch, which fed exclusively on the cactus nectar, might have seemed the more interesting bird. But it would be the medium ground finch with its stubby beak eating seeds, cactus, just about anything that would teach them what made Darwin's finches tick. We found that they were extraordinarily variable. So if we were to think in human terms, they would be the equivalent of a population where there were two foot to 10 foot adults, humans. So they were enormously variable in size and build, size and shape. What about Caldinia? They got to work. First, observing what the finches ate. Add three more tribulus. There are 40 species of plants. We know them all. So uh, we can easily document the abundance of each of the species that are significant in the lives of finches. Not only that, since the finches are so tame, um, we can observe exactly what they're eating. They are so tame that in some cases we have to put our binoculars away. We can't focus down closely enough in order to see what they're doing, or we back away until they come into focus. Bird by bird, year by year, they log deaths and births, pairings and courtships and idiosyncrasies. He's just taken out the stigma and flicked it out in order to get down to the nectar. The length of the stigma is exactly the same distance from the tip of the bill to the eye 
and we think that they just remove it just to get it out of the way and to be able to get into the nectar. Then they began to bend them. In order to understand who survives best, under what conditions, we put bands on it. And we code the colour bands in such a way that we never need to capture the bird again. Disappeared. That was something three. At one point in their study, they banded every finch on the island. About 1,000 of them. They still know every one. 837 is um, a cactus finch um, that was born in 1987. We know its entire history. We know uh, its parents. I've forgotten the parents at the moment, but they're in the computer back at home. We know that it bred for the first time in 1981. It stayed on this territory throughout its whole life, other than making little foraging trips out to steal food from other territory owners. Um, it's had two mates, one in 91 and 92, uh, and again in 93, and a new one this year. I think the female, the original female died. We know the number of offspring it produced, and a few more years' time, we'll know the number of those offspring that themselves are breeding, are recruited to the population as breeding adults. Um, there are other birds we know very much more about because they have lived very much longer. I think that's 10826's mate, darling. She survived him. Little three, seven five or seven four? Seven five, isn't it? Little three, seven five. They try to find them all, alive or dead, to follow each one's history through to the end. No, I can't read it. It's so faint I'll have to use my binoculars as a microscope. And the numbers get worn almost to the point of disappearance. This one ended up as an owl's dinner. Looks like 15666. As their database began to grow, they set up a vigil. Either they or colleagues would be here every season. If anything changed in the finch population on Daphne, they'd know it. The finch investigation unit, as they would be called, had set about the business of furthering Darwin's theory of evolution. Though they didn't know it at the time. One, one, nine. She is 14492. <laughs> She's a favoured bird. She comes wherever we are. We can be on the other side of the island banding finches and she'll somehow find us. Really? Yeah, and she doesn't, it's not for food. She just comes. Really? <laughs> she just likes you. The temperature on Daphne today is 114 degrees. That's normal for January. I saw one up there. There's one feeding. There. Oh, that one? Yes. It just carried some a portulaca flower. It snipped it off. While they continue their inventory on the island, the grants are taking me through the paces of finch evolution. So that bill was 835, 83 on one leg, metal, 5, light green on the right leg. And what would that tell you? That tells me it's an adult male. Uh, I know that bird in particular. It was banded a couple of years ago. It's uh, two years old and it nests in one of those cactus bushes up there. I think I'm prepared. Having read Jonathan Weiner's Pulitzer Prize winning book on their study, The Beak of the Finch. And I remember some of what I learned about evolution in school. The theory is simple enough. The two main ingredients are natural selection and genetics. In natural selection, there is a climatic change on Earth, which causes competition. In the case of the finches, it's competition for food. Those best adapted to eat the food survive. Those who aren't, die. That's natural selection. In genetics, the genes of the survivors are passed down to the next generation. And the next. If the climatic conditions stay the same, the survivor's line will continue to thrive. And here's the interesting part. Their beaks may even begin to change, becoming better adapted to their food source, almost like tools. But Darwin said it took millions of years to achieve any measure of evolution. 
The grants are about to show me it doesn't. You go to the net, you don't know what is there. We head for the nets. Is this where you catch all the birds? We catch them all over the island. Here's one good place because the birds roost here. And you put it up when it was cool. Yes, and we're going to get these birds out before the sun rises up and strikes the net because we want to measure the birds and release them before it gets too hot. Can you tell immediately what species they are? Yes, this is a scandens. I'll have to check the book to see if it's a back cross, but it looks like a scandens uh, 5069. He owns the territory over there. And then here we have Fortis, a small Fortis. Small, small beak, beak like Fortis, it. that's right. You have a Magnarostris down there. Big beak. Yes, undoubtedly big beak. And then this one is a Fortis. Mm -hmm. The birds don't get hurt by this, but they get a little bit tangled. So I take the legs out first, and then I take the wings out, and then I've got to move this netting over the head. And there it comes. Mm -hmm. One, four, metal four. Now you can see this one is a smaller beak. Yes. This one is thicker, heavier. And yet they're the same species. So why okay. the difference? Part of the reason for the difference is that the medium ground finch hybridizes with a smaller species and with a larger species. By hybridizing or mating with another species and producing offspring, the medium ground finch has become a species of both small and large beaked birds. The difference is only a millimeter or more, small by our standards, but significant by finches. The next step is to measure the birds, Peter's job like that, pinch it there so that it can't come back, I mean fly backwards and upwards and out. I then weigh it, 18.6 grams. And again the reason for that? Uh, measuring size, different aspects of the size of the birds in order to understand who survives best, under what conditions. We need to measure so many birds. And now I'll measure the length of one element of the leg and then the next one I take is the length of the beak. Now well, this seems to be the most critical measurement you're going to make. The beak dimensions are the critical feature, at least one critical feature determining success or failure of these birds. So I measure the depth or the height of the beak in the plane of the nostril, and that is 8.6, and then I measure the width of the beak at the base of the lower mandible there and that one is also 8.6 while peter does the measurements rosemary takes blood samples now I'll release it after 33 years of marriage they've learned to watch out for each other don't sit down and the finches <laughs> I'm going to do this. If you could lift his head, I'll be all right. I think we enjoy working with each other very well. Totally. We can easily differ in opinions. I mean, we quite often do. No, lift the head right up, if you could. The moments that I have most enjoyed um, intellectually are often when Peter and I are really, we have a difficult problem that we are, um, we discuss with each other and this can go on for days or even weeks when we're just trying to fathom out something um, rather difficult. After three weeks of observing, catching and measuring the finches on Daphne, the Grants have finished their inventory. A check beneath a few cactus plants has turned up some disturbing news. I have about ten of them underneath the cactus bush there. This is what you've been finding? We found by looking at the underneath the cactus bushes and where they sleep at night, we found a large number of dead birds and we think that they probably did not have enough food um, for them to last the night. And so they, they just died due, due to starvation at night. It always raises an alarm when they find something like this. Are you ever personally affected when you see the dead birds? Oh, yes, especially if it's a bird that um, maybe has been around camp a lot. 
And then there are other birds that you just, a lot, either they're long-lived or you just get to know, or you just get to know their little, their sort of odd, quirky ways, then it's always sad when they die. Their early estimate is that as many as 50% of the birds have died. And why? And um, probably because there were a large number of birds on the island and um, there hadn't been any rain for about 10 months and so the food supply was extremely low. There was probably a lot of interaction over the food and um, a large number of birds died or disappeared during that time. It's bad, but they've seen worse. The drought of 1977 was the most severe drought to hit the Galapagos in a decade. The islands were without rain for 550 days. Plants and animals alike shriveled and died. We were on the island in November 1977 with the children and it had been this dreadful drought when really there just seemed to be nothing alive on the island except for cactus. And a lot of the birds had died. The medium ground finches that had coexisted peacefully began to fight for the little food that was left. There's a tribulus. Tribulus and loremia, another tribulus. The grants were four years into their study. 600 of the finches had been banded and measured. Now, on hands and knees, they began to study the finches' only remaining food supply, seeds. We had been sampling systematically the food supply twice in 1976, three times in 1977, and then several times in subsequent years, and been able to establish how many seeds were available for the finches at different times of the year. So you can see here that there's a variety of seed types, Camisaisi, small seed, Tribulus being the large seed. We knew then from estimating the seeds available in our grids that these ones were diminishing in numbers relatively slowly over that drought period and these small ones were diminishing rapidly. And so we have been able to piece together the fact that the finches were eating these at a high frequency. Then increasingly, as these ones and those ones and yet other small ones became increasingly rare, the birds turned their attention to these ones and we found out that the small beaked birds could not crack those at all. And it's only the very largest beaked members of the Fortis population that are capable of picking one whole tribulus mericarp up and crunching it, cracking it open and splitting open the seeds. So, in a drought, when this is the only food available, the food of last resort, the bird that is going to be able to crack and get at that food source is going to be the one that survives. That's right. It's the crucial seed that made the difference between success and failure for many of the finches during the drought of 1977. The drought lasted 18 months. When it was over, they recorded the death toll. How many of the small finches died? During the drought, mm -hmm. about four to 500 of the smaller members of the Fortis population mm -hmm. died. But this was clearly a natural selection event. Oh, absolutely right, yes. It was an event which selectively favored the large beak birds and selectively penalized the small beak birds because they were not able to deal with this remaining large and hard fruit. That's a rather new observation about natural selection, isn't it? Yes, in that um, I don't think uh, most scientists would have thought that um, the size of individuals mattered very much that a small bird would survive just as well as a medium bird, just as well as a large bird. But in fact, the detailed measurements that we were able to make and the ability that we have on this island to follow the fates of known individuals with known measurements enable us to show that, in fact, natural selection operates under stressful conditions and that size does make a difference whether an individual survives or not. What they did next would be crucial. When they returned to Daphne the following year, they would band and measure the next generation of finches. Only then would they know whether they had discovered 
what not even Charles Darwin had seen. It was a cloudy day when the Beagle arrived in the Galapagos. Darwin had been at sea for nearly four years, collecting animal and geological specimens along the South American coast and getting very seasick. He wrote a friend, The misery I endured from seasickness is far beyond what I ever guessed at. The real misery only begins when you are so exhausted that a little exertion makes a feeling of faintness come on. I found nothing but lying in my hammock did any good. But he was anxious to see the Galapagos and its volcanoes. The Beagle landed on San Cristobal on September 17th, then sailed on to Isabella, Floriana, and Santiago. In the month he was there, Darwin saw only those four islands. He wrote of the black lava fields and the broken remains of a crater. He sent specimens of plants to his professor at Cambridge, and then turned his attention to the wildlife. He wrote, In my walk, I met two large tortoises. One was eating a cactus and then quietly walked away. The other gave a deep and loud hiss and then drew back his head. The tortoise is very fond of water, drinking large quantities and wallowing in the mud. The rocks on the coast abound with great black lizards between three and four feet long. And on the hills, an ugly yellowish-brown species was equally common. When not frightened, they slowly crawl along with their tails and bellies dragging on the ground. A gun here is almost superfluous, for with the muzzle of one, I pushed a hawk off the branch of a tree. He was impressed but confused by the finches, writing little about them. The few dull-colored birds cared no more for me than they did for the great tortoises. I must suspect they are only varieties. If they were not, such facts would undermine the stability of species. Darwin's finches became our symbols of evolution, based on the theory that all 13 species evolved from just one that had landed in the Galapagos somewhere between one and three million years ago. It was a violent time. The young islands were still settling volcanoes. Life was hard, food rare. To survive, the finches scattered to various islands, where, isolated from each other, they evolved into 13 species with 13 distinct beaks. Because the islands are still young, weather conditions on the equator mercurial, the Galapagos continue to be a hotbed for evolution. It's not the only place scientists are seeing evolution today. There are over 100 studies going on around the world, but it's still the classic. As for our own evolution, some scientists say we humans have reached the end of our line. Others believe disease and viruses will continue to select out the weakest of us. We're the lucky ones. All but 1% of the species that ever lived on the Earth are extinct. All but 1%. And Darwin's finches? With those kinds of odds, how is it that all 13 species have survived? 
That's the question evolutionary biologists since Darwin have been asking, and why the Grants chose to study them. Peter and Rosemary Grant made their fifth and most important trip to the Galapagos in 1978 to do the measurements that would tell them if the medium ground finch had evolved. To find out whether it had occurred, we went around the island, found as many nests as we could of the parents whose measurements we knew. We banded the offspring as nestlings, allowed them to grow up, and after 60 days when growth has just about ceased, we caught them. And when we made the comparison between the size of the offspring generation and the population before selection, we found a measured evolutionary response had taken place and it was almost identical to what we had predicted. Darwin's finches had evolved. The offspring's beaks were three to four percent deeper than their grandparents. The medium ground finch was becoming a larger species. It is a study that has demonstrated evolution in action. And I think it is important for everybody, not just evolutionary biologists, to know that evolution can be studied within a relatively short space of time, by which I mean over a period of months, maybe one or two years, rather than centuries or the millennia that Darwin thought would be necessary to follow the evolutionary change taking place in a lineage of mammals or birds or any types of plants for that matter. That's where I would place this significance. It's getting really hot, I think. But the grants weren't finished yet. Every year from 1977 to 1982, they returned to Daphne to collect more data on the medium ground finch to see if the large birds continued their dominance on the island. It went on that way for six years, nothing. And then in 1983, the weather on the equator erupted again. This time, it was an El Nino. The most severe El Nino in 400 years. And it took the Galapagos by surprise. On Santa Cruz, they recorded three times the rainfall of their worst storm. I remember one time when it rained for 11 days on end, and everything, even when it's in metal boxes, got damp. And you had no more dry clothes left, and you were putting, you were literally pouring out water from your boots. I remember we even used wax crayons to doubly seam seal our tents because water seemed to get through that. And the vines would grow up the guy ropes of the tents and over the tents. You could even measure the growth of the vines every day. So it was truly extraordinary. When the Grants left for the season, it continued to rain. It rained for eight months. At the Charles Darwin Research Station, the animals were thriving. With tortoises on the um, carapace of the tortoises, when they're very young, you can see growth rings. We could definitely see on, on the young and the wild, the El Nino of 83 was a huge growth ring. I mean, there was so much food available and, and they did very well. On Daphne, the finches began to breed and didn't stop for 10 months. Finches started to breed right at the beginning. Uh, bred in the first months of November, bred again in December, bred again in January, and so on and so on, all the way through to August, producing eight clutches and eight broods of nestlings in total. Just an extraordinary amount of production. The population grew from 150 to more than 1,000. But the El Nino had changed something else too, the vegetation. Now the tables were turned, and the king of the island, the large finch, was suffering. The tribulus seeds, which they are very good at cracking with their large um, bills, the plant is very low, and that was completely covered by grasses and vines. The winner of the drought was the loser in the rainstorm. This time, the victor in the battle of natural selection was the small finch. So the larger billed fortress suffered and died. 
and the smaller build fortis um, that were good at eating the small seeds survived. And so this is why we got this natural selection event, favoring those birds with smaller bills. Now, you may ask, why didn't they just turn to small seeds? Well, the small seed supply was on the decline also in this dry period following El Nino. And I think it was difficult for them to uh, try to find hard seeds as well as make up their daily diet with small seeds. And they died as a result. Starvation. That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. The El Nino of 1982 was pulling the finches in the opposite direction, now toward becoming a smaller species. When the next generation of birds was born and the Grants did their measurements, they saw what they thought they'd only been lucky enough to see once in their lifetime. Darwin's finches had evolved again. So you had now two examples of natural selection right there in front of you. Both with an evolutionary, evolutionary response. Which yeah. would answer the question, why doesn't one, the large species simply get larger and larger and uh, continue? That's right. There's a tendency for the species to shift in size, average size, in one direction, and then it's reversed when the climatic conditions reverse and environmental circumstances change. So we see over the long term the population fluctuating back and forth between larger and smaller sizes, but with a long-term average set by the long-term average food conditions on the island. After the 1983 El Nino, the Grants continued to monitor the finches on Daphne. There were droughts and rainstorms, but nothing significant enough to cause the finches to evolve again. Still, they returned. There's always something to study about Darwin's finches. Now they're looking at hybrids to see what will come of them. It's hard not to wonder what Charles Darwin would have thought of all this. He never got the chance to return to the Galapagos, to see the finches who bore his name. The trip on the Beagle seems to have made him ill off and on for the rest of his life. But on his return to England in 1836, he continued to think about what he'd seen here, and he wrote a theory that would get the entire world thinking about evolution. Do you feel close to Darwin? Oh, yes. We are undoubtedly following in his footsteps. There's an element of exploration which we still experience in what we're doing. Uh, building upon Darwin's observations, his insights, and the questions that he was asking, not only when he was here, but later. Uh, how do species form? Why are there as many species as there are of different types? How can they coexist? We're still grappling with those questions and uh, let us hope building upon the foundation that he established. So, not a bad day today. You found a hybrid. Mm -hmm. And a magnorostrus nest. Oh, that's right. That's right. Oh, here, you're allowing them to eat. <laughs> yeah, look, 044, you should know better. First bird to kick my beer over goes into the sea. Today, the medium ground finches of Daphne Major continue their push and pull game with evolution, leaving them somewhere in between. But tomorrow, who knows what will happen? on these enchanted islands. Thursday night, don't quit on me now. We've got places to go, people to see. We even have all of Canada to explore for Pete's sake. If we hurry, we can catch the last train across Canada tomorrow night at 8. Now, Great Performances kicks off its 23rd season with a gala celebration at Carnegie Hall's opening night. Next on Channel 2.